What's up guys, Rosh here and welcome to All About Climate, a channel which is all about climate science. Today's video was inspired by the recent spectacular images of the volcanic eruption in Iceland. If you haven't seen them yet, seriously, go check them out, you won't be disappointed. Now unsurprisingly, as a geology graduate, I was enthralled by the scenes of molten rock cascading across the Icelandic landscape, and it got me thinking about the immense geological forces which operate beneath our feet, and how they relate to climate. Because even for me, it's easy to forget that we live on a precariously thin crust which lies above a vast ocean of semi-molten and molten rock. To give you an idea of just how thin the Earth's crust is, take this apple. If the Earth was scaled down to the same size as this delicious fruit, the Earth's crust would be about the same thickness as the apple skin. Except unlike the apple, the Earth's skin is broken into fragments, the tectonic plates. And while we may think of rocks as being hard and brittle, the vast majority of rock in the planet is more like plasticine. It's hot and ductile and deforms under the immense pressure within the mantle. Occasionally it melts completely and erupts through the crust to give us the kind of display we saw in Iceland, a glimpse into the inner depths of the Earth. It's also easy for us to lose sight of the mind-bogglingly large timescales on which the Earth system operates. As I speak, the Earth beneath your feet is moving. It's imperceptible to us, centimetres or fractions of a centimetre per year, but over hundreds of millions of years, the segments of brittle crust which float atop the ductile depths collide to create mountain ranges, tear themselves apart to create colossal rifts, and come together again in a kaleidoscope of land masses which create, destroy and reform the topography of the world. The crust is constantly recycled by the Earth, with new crust forming where plates diverge, and old crust being sucked into the Earth's interior where they converge. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's all very interesting, Roche, but what does it have to do with climate? And the answer is everything. Because alongside changes in solar irradiance, geological processes have been the single biggest driver of climate change in Earth's past. And when you think about it, that's really not surprising. As I've said many times on this channel, all drivers of climate change fall into one of three categories. Those which affect solar insulation, those which affect albedo, and those which affect the greenhouse effect. Changes in solar insulation, the amount of energy we receive from the sun, are largely driven by the sun itself, but the Earth's orbit and orientation also play significant roles. But while neither of these are intrinsically tied to geology, both albedo and the greenhouse effect are. As tectonic plates move around, they change the appearance of Earth's surface, and this, unsurprisingly, affects albedo. For one thing, land surfaces are brighter than the oceans, and so reflect more sunlight away than their dark, watery counterparts. And since the Earth doesn't receive the same amount of sunlight all over, where these surfaces are located can have a significant effect on the total albedo of the planet. The orientation of the land masses also affects ocean circulation, which can have a powerful effect on regional climate. And then there's volcanism. Volcanoes can spew ash and tiny particles into the atmosphere, which can reflect sunlight away into space and increase the Earth's albedo. And over geological time, volcanism is the single biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, most notably CO2. And it's not just volcanoes on land which do this. As tectonic plates tear themselves apart and drift away from each other, great rifts in the ocean crust are created. Semi-molten rock in the mantle wells up to fill these gaps, and as it rises the drop in pressure allows it to melt. This process forms mid-ocean ridges, underwater mountain ranges which continuously create fresh basaltic crust from the magma below. At times in Earth's past, volcanism has gone into overdrive, like during the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. During this time, an entire continent tore itself apart, and as the crust cracked and split open, molten rock spewed up to fill the gaps. This caused the Earth to churn out a potent mix of greenhouse gases, and over a period of millions of years, atmospheric CO2 levels soared to over a thousand parts per million, more than three times the concentration of today. This created an incredibly hot world, devoid of ice caps, with sea levels many hundreds of feet above present levels, and tropical rainforests covering much of the land surface. This was the environment in which T. rex, triceratops and velociraptors flourished. 
But you may be wondering, if the Earth is constantly pumping out CO2, then why doesn't CO2 continuously rise forever? And the answer also lies in geology. Because as mountain ranges rise, they expose fresh rock which weathers and chemically reacts with rainwater. These chemical reactions pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and into rock and sediment. Eventually, these rocks will be sucked back into the Earth's interior as the tectonic plates they are part of are subducted into the mantle. This constant cycling of carbon from the Earth's interior to the atmosphere and back again is known as the geological carbon cycle. Over hundreds of millions of years, these geological processes have dictated the Earth's climate. When volcanism exceeds weathering, atmospheric CO2 levels rise and the planet warms. And when weathering exceeds volcanism, CO2 is pulled out of the atmosphere and the world cools. And as tectonic plates shift, meld and deform, they change the very surface of the Earth, and in turn they change albedo. Of course, all of this occurs on timescales too large for humans to adequately comprehend. Perhaps the most eloquent description of geological time comes from one of my personal heroes, Carl Sagan, who, when comparing humans to stars, said that we are like mayflies, fleeting, ephemeral creatures who live out our entire lives over the course of a single day. Personally, I find that incredibly poetic. It certainly helps me put my problems into perspective. So as you marvel at the fire and brimstone currently spewing out of Iceland, just take a moment to reflect that it is but a glimpse of something far more powerful, far more destructive, and yet far more beautiful than anything any human will ever be able to witness. It is a glimpse into the forces which created our world, a glimpse into both the past and the future, a glimpse into creation itself. So that's it. I hope this video has given you an insight into why I find geology so fascinating. It's so much more than just rocks. Even a rock is more than just a rock, but that's more than enough nerdiness for one day. If you want to see more geology content, then let me know in the comments. I'd be more than happy to share my passion with you guys. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye. Decided to eat the apple.